here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk um, 2022 Q2 market updates. I think this has been a difficult and serious time for a lot of people. So of course, all jokes aside, um, this is a time when people feel the most pain in their portfolios and in their retirement plans. And it can make people shake a little bit in terms of their own risk tolerance. So it's, it's helpful for us to spend some time and understand the lay of the land. So I'd love, I'd love to make sure that um, I don't want to sugarcoat it, folks. I hope that we can help people understand what really are concerns and what really does matter. But also, um, I do think that the news tends to over-dramatize and scare. And so I, I hope we can distill some of that as well. Okay, so Kurt Brown, Chief Investment Officer with Townsquare Capital. And Kurt joins us on these quarterly uh, meetings. Kurt oversees a team of traders and investment professionals that do due diligence on portfolios that um, that we like and that we, we place our clients' assets with. And it is their team's job to ensure that those are both um, good solutions as well as that they're managed in, with the right um, parameters. And, and there's just a lot of due diligence work being done there. So we coordinate closely with Townsquare. Um, Matt Johns is one of our wealth advisors at Capita Financial Network and tends to do this stuff for fun at night. And so it's good to have Matt on the calls because um, you know, he's, you know, the rest of us go home and do other things. Um, this is what he loves and he, he knows what's going on and, and stays up on it. Um, I'm here to run logistics. Um, I help train the advisors at Capita on financial planning topics and make sure that they're taking care of you in the right way. Um, so with that being said, uh, how does that sound, Kurt? Anything else you would add before we dive in? That sounds great. But if you're here running logistics and we didn't get bumper music, you're already down. <laughs> I'm <one>. already. <laughs> I've, I've offended right people. Like, There's been no bumper music. I know. And, <laughs> and, I, is... and I'm not going to lie to you. I love people coming to my defense, but I know Carl was just funning with me. Like he wasn't like, really giving it to me. So you, know, I, you know, Carl I'm was good. like, I'm going to see if they even know what this word means. Um, <laughs> all right. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Kurt. Why don't you well, run hate, your slides? In the spirit of that, I'm going to do, in the spirit of your suggestion, I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to start the presentation at the end. Okay. Let's do the this. Bottom line it. How does that sound? I like that. I like that a lot. Let's do this. Be, and I have found that your clients are some of the more astute. So let's do this. I'm going to start at the end with the summary page and blow up the Q&A with things you want me to elaborate on and I'll elaborate on them. Okay, I like I've it. I've got 52 slides here that are nothing but pure statistical gems and, and, and economic prattle that I can blast out at you if we need to. So let's do it that way, okay? All right, so here's, here's what we think is going on, okay? And this is one of those, we've gotten into one of those situations where the bad news is the good news, okay? When you have an economy that's overheating, you're in one of the rare times where you want the economy to slow down. So remember what right now is bad, inflation is bad because things are so good. The economy was so good that it became bad. So, so this is one of those rare moments in economic history where you actually want your own economy to slow down. And that's what we've been needing. So we think the economy is slowing down a lot more than the rear view looking data is showing you. If you look at the last set of inflation data, we think that is really old news. And I'm going to show a few slides that will support that. Okay. So as a result, we actually think the Fed is going to raise interest rates, Zach, a lot less than the bond market has priced in. The bond market and bond investors are already down the road and they've already put into the bond market another 1.25% of interest rate hikes by the Fed. We don't think it's going to happen. We think that, that, that already a lot of the heavy lifting has been done uh, and that the economy is starting to slow down. Again, I'll show you a few slides here in a second. Well, and as you, uh, Kurt, I'm going to yeah. jump in real fast because you're yeah. making a point that like, snowballs when people are like, well, why do I care what bond yields are doing and what feds are doing with if, uh, interest rates? This is being driven. This is what's driving the market to slow down. And to your very point, it's overheated. This is as those yields increase, even though the fed still is going to raise rates, the market's pricing in that they've already done that. 
That's right. So, so now you start to think, well, what's the market going to do? If the Fed comes out and says they're going to raise it quicker than what the market's expecting, the market will go down more. That's right. If they come in and deliver at that, we'll probably just stay sideways. And if they come in under that, which is what you're saying, right, Kurt, you think potentially the market could be overshooting it, which would be a more positive, uh, meaning the market's priced in a lot of bad news or maybe more than what the news is going to be. But, We're starting to think that most of the bad news is priced in, to be honest with you. In fact, in the last just two weeks, bond traders are pricing in rate cuts in 2023. And there were no cuts on the horizon at like two or three weeks ago. That's how quickly we're starting to see the economy cool off. And, and so we think that's good. We think most of the bad news is now priced in. Now, that being said, Words like inflation and recession are really scary, and they shouldn't be. Um, a recession, we probably already have been in one, because when you have a year where the growth is so high, like last year, just slowing down a little bit puts you into a recession. That's not necessarily a bad thing. This is one of those moments, again, where a mild recession is exactly what the doctor would order. All that means is a little bit of negative growth. And what that will do is keep inflation from spiraling out of control. We absolutely have to get the inflation to slow down. And everyone that's joining today would agree with that, I'm sure. It got too crazy. Try and buy an airline ticket, uh, you know, just flying to the Midwest anywhere. Try and buy an airline ticket. You're going to pay over a thousand bucks for any airline ticket right now. It's ridiculous. Um, okay, so we think for sure recession, but probably not a deep recession, probably something relatively mild that quite frankly, again, is sort of what the doctor ordered, right, Matt? Yeah, it's, it's 100%. And I think if you're watching news outlets and you're hearing media talk about it, they've, they've used the term smooth landing, yeah. right? Uh, the Fed's trying to bring this in for a smooth landing. This is really, Kurt, what you're, what you're hitting on. And the, the, the neat part is we'll go through the reason why the smooth landing could possibly be there. But yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's the goal. The fear though, you guys, is as you think back as now here goes my negative is when you think about how the fed has reacted in these markets is they've tend to either over, they tend to overdo it in whatever direction they go. And so that's, that's kind of the unforeseen risk. The, so the market going too far is actually a positive. Does that make right. sense? Is that, that's right. does that connect? Hey, um, can I, can we do a little bit on definitions here? Because I think our clients um, oftentimes, and this goes to Keith Jensen, your question about market correction and economic recession. So um, let's just go through a couple terms. A correction in the stock market is a 10% decline. So that's happened for sure. A bear market is a 20% decline also happened. So we have been in a correction and a bear market. So both of those things have already happened. Um, those two terms, correction and bear market, are very much tied to the stock market activity, whereas a recession is not a measurement of stock market movement. And that's something I want to decouple, if I can, here for a minute, because people oftentimes think a recession is synonymous with a large decline in the stock market. A recession doesn't have a specific decline in the stock market. A recession is two quarters of negative GDP growth. So the, the economy, not the market, the economy or how much businesses are producing has decreased for two quarters in a row. Oftentimes, the actual market decline happens at the beginning or before, mm -hmm. you know, even before. It's, they say that market is a leading economic indicator of the economy's recessions. So in other words, what Kurt's talking about, about things being priced in, the market participants, all of us, or anybody who's out there really trying to predict what's going to happen in the future, starts to sell and price in a recession well in advance. So the question is not necessarily, are we in for a recession? What will that do to stock markets? Is The question is really, has the general public priced it in accurately or inaccurately and in what direction and by how far? And that's why it's so difficult to predict this. But anyway, mostly um, wanted to decouple those things between a market correction and an economic recession. They're both different terms and on different things, the market or the economy. And 
Zach, I'm so glad you did that because I hear these terms thrown around a lot and then the media will throw them around improperly. Right. They, they, they will actually call a recession a bear market and vice versa. You know, uh, I, let me give you a stunning statistic about what you just said. In the last 75 years, there's been 11 recessions. That means two quarters or more of our, our gross domestic product, GDP, going down. That's all that means. Two quarters in a row of an economy that got a little smaller or a lot smaller. That's what a recession is, okay? So it's happened 11 times in 75 years. In every single case, the stock market bottomed at least three to six months before the economic data bottomed. So the point is, is, is by the time the data from the Federal Reserve tells us we're out of a recession, the stock market bottomed months earlier. If not and, almost and, a year, right? Yeah. Like six yeah. months plus earlier. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a minimum of three months. Right. And in, in, in all cases, a minimum of that. So, so it's important to remember that, that the market, what Zach said, is looking forward and has a tendency to overcorrect to his point. It, 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 because what happens is we all stop for a minute and look around and try to figure out what's going on. And nervousness controls things in the short term, just like greed controls things when things look perfect. And then the market overshoots to the upside. And that's why a market is wild in its movements because it has a tendency, us, to fixate on it's all good right now or it's all bad. That's a great point, Zach. My favorite saying on this theme is the stock market bottoms on bad news. That's if you right. can just kind of keep that, it's never going to bottom on great news. It's never to, to everything you two have just said. Yeah, yeah. It's, a good, it's a good thing to think about. Yeah. We, we, the, the, the supply chain is getting a lot better. I'm going to show you guys some stunning charts in a minute here about how rapidly our supply chain is sorting itself out. It's another reason we needed a mild slowdown in the economy. Um, the housing shortage is quickly changing. I'm going to show you some weird things on that in a second too. And, and our bottom line takeaway is we think that the stock market has almost, well, a, a, at the very least, a high percentage of the bad news is now priced in. It got incredibly pessimistic. People were sort of pricing in either hyperinflation or an awful recession. And we don't see either one of those as a possibility. So how's that, Zach? Starting at the end and then I'll love show it. I love it. Time. I love it. Um, okay. kind of fo a follow-up question in the Q&A was, um, what do you mean by mean priced in? Um, I'm just writing back to you here, um, but I'll, I'll answer it live as well, which is the idea that stocks are being traded by institutions or individuals, all of us, based on what we think the market or the economy will look like in six to 20 months. So in other words, we're all pricing in. If, if you know, Amazon stock is where it is today after you know, it's gone down quite a bit, it's because people think pe that, it, that consumers are going to spend a certain amount on Amazon and that number might be a lot less than the reality. If that number's better than, than what everybody guessed, Amazon price should go up. So that's, that's really complicated because it's, it's like, I, I, I would relate this to driving 50 miles an hour um, in a car facing backwards with the steering wheel facing backwards. And all you've got is, is kind of a rear view mirror, but most of the time you're looking actually out the back of the car at the road where it was, and you're hoping to stay on it. Can you imagine how much you would fly off that road and then you'd see where it was and you'd hurry and correct back. That's exactly what's going on with markets. They're just, yeah. the pricing in is finally seeing the road and fixing what they guessed wrong. Yeah. Okay, so questions. So Kurt, why don't we do this? Yeah. Unless you, I know that people are gonna have inflation questions. So Bob's question is important. Let's tackle that one. Um, and then if, if you have other slides that you're like, you, your, your investors need to know this today, even if it's not in one of the questions, yeah. please, please, please show it to us. Let, let, and, and, and the main slides I want to show actually are about inflation. I, in fact, let me put a fine point on it. We think it's possible that we're right in the middle of the peak of inflation and it's already actually going back down. Okay. So I, 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 we could end up being wrong, but I want to show you what's happening in real time in this country right now. And this is not going to show up in the first and second quarter economic data. This is real time 
like high frequency data. So let's go through a couple of them real quick. And I put it under the section that says monetary tightening is painful, but it's working. And this is one of those times we all want to root for a little slowdown, a little cooling in the economy. So let me show you. And I'm going to go through these fast. These are what we call leading economic indicators in this country. This is the most real-time, high-frequency data. The Federal Reserve right now estimates that this quarter's GDP is going to be down 2%. This quarter. And that would be the second quarter in a row. And that would put us officially in a recession. So it's the weirdest recession of all time because unemployment is non-existent. And earnings growth is great. It's a really weird recession. But we were coming off of a year of red hot economic growth. So if you cool that down a little bit, you're in a recession. Doesn't mean it needs to be an awful recession. This is manufacturing orders, tanking. Here's, o, right, here's COVID and here's 08. So we're rolling over quickly. Manufacturing orders are a leading economic indicator because businesses are looking out and seeing, do I need inventory? And right now they're saying, stop making stuff. I don't need inventory, right? Look at the collapse in durable goods orders. Okay, so all the big stuff that you want to buy, the washing machines, the dryers, the refrigerators, the deep freezes, all these things, these are great leading economic indicators. Usually when people are buying this stuff, you're going into a boom. They're falling off a cliff. Everybody loaded up on this stuff coming out of COVID. How about this? Real personal consumption. So this is if you strip out the inflation, how much, how much are people buying compared to what they bought a year ago? It's tanking. Look at this. We almost never flip negative in this, in this piece of data. And the Federal Reserve loves this data. This is actually some of the most accurate inflation data you can get is, is in what we call real personal consumption. And it's stopping. People in the last 90 days are sitting on their wallets and they are spending a lot less money. And that's exactly what we needed, right? Uh, you see lumber prices are cratering. Uh, what do we got here? We got cotton prices cratering. Um, used cars were a major, major thorn in our side coming out of COVID. It was a disaster. You couldn't get your hand on anything. Well, look at this. Quickly, new car inventory is coming back online. And as a result, used car sales are tanking. Okay. Again, we needed it. This was a real problem. Okay. This is stunning. This is really, really interesting. Okay. This is when Russia invaded Ukraine. Okay, this is wheat prices globally. And most of you know that between Russia and Ukraine, they account for one third of the world's wheat exports, those two countries. So you would think with those two countries shutting everything down for six months, that wheat prices would be skyrocketing. And they were when we were all worried about the globe being in high inflation. Okay, look at what's happening. Wheat prices are cratering. You tell me if we're headed into a hyperinflation environment with that statistic right there. We just took a third of the world's wheat offline and wheat prices are coming back to almost to where they were when the war started. So this really gives you an insight into what's happening out there in real time. And Kurt, so, on that, before yeah. you keep going, because this is yeah. in that same vein, another thing that Russia and Ukraine are big on, or Russia is, they're big on potash, which is used for fertilizer, which is just agricultural in general. Mm -hmm which was another fear that it was going to send it. You see the same thing that you're showing here. I could pull up a chart of a publicly traded company that makes fertilizer and their stock price would be following this yep. wheat chart, almost lock and step. So again, it's, it's another verification of your thesis that you're kind of laying out here of it correcting a little bit, but just interesting to think about yeah. that it's, it's twofold agricultural yep. though, but yep. not as bad. And, and remember, we were all coming out of this period in, in, around March, April, where we felt like there was this hyperinflation. No one could get their hands on anything, but that is not actually what the data is showing. Let me show you a couple other things that are kind of stunning. Remember how hard it was to get semiconductor chips out of, out of Korea? Remember, it, this was a part of the problem with the, with the car production. And we just couldn't get cars out. We just had one of the largest uh, builds, monthly builds of semiconductors ever since the data has been recorded. So a lot of the chip manufacturers are really backing and filling and, and we have a lot of semiconductor capacity coming back online now. Okay, this one is mind blowing. Uh, in the 30 years I've been in the business, I've rarely seen this kind of data. Um, this is inventory levels. So, so remember coming out of COVID, no one had inventory. 
Everything was shut down. We couldn't get ships out of China, et cetera, right? Okay, we just had the opposite flip in, 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 a, in a really, really quick period of time. So this is the change in inventory levels at the biggest retailers in 90 days. Walmart increased their inventory. This is the largest retailer in the world. They have 32% more inventory than 90 days ago. 32%? Oh, they think about the size of inventory build at a place like Walmart Global, right? But their sales were only up 4%. And by the way, inflation was 8%. So their sales were actually down. They brought in more money, but the number of units they sold were down. Look at Amazon. Amazon retailers on, online, almost a 50% inventory build in 90 days. This is why I'm telling you, we are seeing the very front end of, of inflation peaking and recession becoming the concern, not inflation. We're seeing it right now in real time. Home Depot, same thing, 32%. Costco, 26, right? Uh, Walgreens, totally different story. I don't know what they're doing there. Target, 43% inventory build. It's a total indictment of what's going on. So Kurt, translate that yeah. and for help us out. Go back to that. So basically... Okay, so these, all oh, these is... large institutions have thrown a ton of money into building up inventory, which means typically when there's more things out there, they would cost less, which would be deflationary. Right. And, and so what you're telling us here is, and, and just to make sure that we're all following, what you're saying here is, hey, a lot of these big businesses have built up so much inventory that it's, it, there's a good chance, I don't want to put words in your mouth here with inflation, but there's a good chance that that actually does some slowing to inflation uh, right. because there's so much stuff out there. That's right. And hey, nobody's wanting it. to buy it. If you own a business and, you're, and your warehouse is chock full of inventory and you just spent all this money to get the inventory, how, how much pricing power do you have up again? They had a lot of pricing power coming out of COVID because nobody could get their hands on inventory. But now if you've got a ton of inventory, okay, now you're right, Zach. How much are you going to be increasing prices when you're really like, hey, me and all of my competitors are sitting on warehouses full of inventory, right? You got to get rid of it. You got to get rid of it, right? The other thing we heard that was really stunning was both Walmart and Amazon in the last month have both said they have plenty of employees and maybe too many. Well, we haven't heard that in a long time from either one of those companies that they actually might be overstaffed right now. And again, what does that do? Think through that a little bit. If you have to lower prices a little bit or keep prices the same, you might have to start laying a few people off. These are deflationary forces, not inflationary forces, right? Um, one quick thing on that. Steve pointed out on that legend on that last one. It was, it was at, not last 90 days. It's from Q1 2021 compared to Q1 2022. Oh, right. You're Sorry. Still, year but, no, no, you're, but year over year, still yeah. the point, still... Uh, yeah. Good catch there, Steve. Good catch. Good catch. Yeah, four quarters, not one quarter. Four quarters. Yeah. But still, you think about it, it was even more heightened a year ago, the co supply chain constraint. And we're saying a year forward, exactly. The supply chains aren't, aren't and then you're, the constraint as much. And then your concept, and I'm not trying to like convince us of inflation going one way or another, <laughs> but like, but your concept, I guess, was that demand has come down because you mentioned people are guarding their wallets a little bit more. So spending a little less in the last little, and that's not, that's a trend of the last, like very short term, right? That's, that's, that's right. within the last month or so right. that we've seen that come back. We've actually seen spending slowing since last summer. What's okay. been offsetting it is people have to spend more for the same goods. So it looks like consumer spending is flat, but the number of things being sold are actually down. Right. This, that people have had to spend more to get less. That's basically, you know, what's been going on. So, and as you talk about the deflationary effects, one thing you look at, this is something I've actually looked at is like the number of job postings on like indeed.com and different stuff. Those have gone down. Um, as you talk about potentially you'd hear somebody say, well, they might have to reduce their workforce or not hire as much. Those are good because these companies are combating inflation. Yeah. And if they also have to combat Yes. Rising wages of employees to get talent, meaning that it's too hard to get people to go to work, that that puts another constraint on the business. It's very negative. So this is another positive for the Fed. If you could have said the Fed would have asked you to slow down your spending, they probably would have told American corporations to slow down their hiring. That's right. And 
and this is this is a byproduct of that as well. Not something that you know six o'clock news is going to talk about, but it, it's a genuine positive towards the direction of making it so the Fed doesn't have to react so aggressively. That's right, and or you know it was it was really underreported last week. But Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook or Meta, whatever he calls it now, had this had this employee meeting and really. I mean, he really laid down the law and I was surprised the news media didn't pick this up more, but I mean, he basically said, we're overstaffed and you better get, you better come to work. And they have a very relaxed liberal work environment. And he basically rang the alarm bell and said, you better get to work because we're going to make this place more efficient, more optimal. We have too many employees. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And Matt, to your point, that's going to help the labor market get more equilibrium in it for both the employer and the employee. It's kind of been a one direction market since COVID, you know? Yeah, 100%. Let's do, let's, while we're on this inflation topic, um, there are a couple specific questions. I think we've addressed them in part, but maybe yeah. we, could, we could just button those up really well. Yeah. And Paul asked about, you know, how much of this inventory, inventory growth is related to delayed orders from COVID. I mean, yeah. I could see a slingshot effect, right? That that they're yeah, you see they it weren't here. producing. Yeah, see that we're kind so, of overcorrecting coming out of it the other way, right? It was like a rubber band built up. That's a it, it absolutely is about that because everyone got scared to death of being out of inventory. So as soon as China was open for business, man, we are stockpiling inventory. But here's the irony: now our economy is starting to slow down, and we just stockpile up all this inventory, right? Yeah, and I can't. I mean, being those being those business managers of large corporations with that much lag time around your your predictions and modeling to when you actually get inventory in your hands, yeah. um, these types of market swings wreak you, havoc on that. And you saw like lumber. Lumber is a good example of this, where they couldn't get the lumber mills to overproduce. Everybody's asking the lumber mills, you know, out of COVID, like you guys need to ramp it up, and they're like, you know what? Nope, we're going to run at eighty yeah. percent capacity. And they 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 didn't run at full capacity, and and now they're sitting there going, we'll see. This is why we didn't do it. We didn't know this was going to happen, but we just didn't want to be caught holding the bag of wood. Yeah. So, well, and, and you guys have all heard, I'm sure most people have heard that cheeky little saying that the cure to high prices is high prices, right? I mean, <laughs> when, when you come out of COVID, you, there was so much collateral damage. It was hard to have competition. It was hard to even run a business. But if you keep prices up there, people find ways to fill that need. It opens up more competition. So you don't get in the United States prices staying high for very long because it, the, the competitive juices will flow and somebody's going to come compete against you, right? Like right now you can have American Airlines shutting down certain routes, but you're going to get other carriers that come in and say, great, you're going to pull out of that market. I'm coming in, right? And those competitive forces will get that equilibrium back. We've been in that weird part of the curve where coming out of COVID, everybody could jack up prices on us. And, the, and, and we had all this extra money in our pockets and it created this short-term inflation that is now going to be sorted out. Uh, it, 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 we're just too, our, our economy is just too competitive, you know? So talk about markets um, because people, like Bob asked this question, um, does the market always trend down when we have higher inflation? And I believe we see a lot of variable, variable market directions and magnitudes, right? In different amounts in different, I mean, but explain that like, yeah, it's a problem for businesses but some businesses, no, some benefit from inflation. Could you talk? And what I mean by businesses, Bob, is the market is a bunch of stocks, right? And so some of those stocks are going to do well in inflation and some are going to do poorly. But Kurt, could you expand on like how, like what, how many businesses do poorly typically as a percentage maybe of the market? And how does it typically go in your experience? You know, it's interesting because I don't have the data right here in front of me, but I was actually just thumbing through my deck. The, here's what you find. It, it, think about what's happened in the past year or two. As the inflation really kicked up, earnings really went up. L let me show you something that will shock you about the fact that most companies are benefiting from this. We're all nervous, and the average consumer is stressed because of costs, but look at margins. So we, we, this is as of June 9th, this data. Well, it's incredible because we've had about five quarters of some pretty meaningful inflation now. And all that's happened is margin stopped going up. They just leveled off. So, so, so far, businesses have been able to make a lot of profit still. Look at this. 
here's the profits of the S and P 500 companies right here. And you, and, and, and so not all uh, inflation and recessions are created equally. So this, we are not in a profits recession, right? This is a term you'll hear economists throw around. Our economy is slowing down, but earnings continue to really grow. And, and we're halfway through this year now, and these estimates are coming in. So far, we're keeping track of this kind of earnings growth for the year, which is actually incredibly impressive given the amount of inflation that there is. So it certainly will end up hurting some businesses because demand will come down, right? Things kind of slow down a little bit. But historically, stocks have actually been a great inflation hedge because the earnings of the company stay up. And, and, and Zach, you hear me obsessing about earnings all the time. Uh, this is the longest running chart that I keep up to date in my entire, for 20 years, I've kept this, this chart up to date. And it's simply the relationship going back to World War II between earnings and stock prices. And so here's the earnings of the S&P 500, and here's the stock prices of the S&P 500. And over time, this is a fantastic way to hedge. Because as we come out of the inflationary period, you're going to, the companies, if, you, you know, if they're able to maintain their margins and their earnings power, you have stocks that get cheap fast. And we are seeing stocks get cheap in a hurry. Perfect. And I was okay. going to say, I think, Zach, you, this is uh, the way I would take it too with this is markets don't always do bad when you have high inflationary times. It's all about what the market expects. Zach talked about the stock market versus the economy. When the stock market's caught off by surprise by the inflation of what's happening, that generally translates to negative. So when you try to say the best market's a predictable market, so to speak, when things are happening. So it doesn't mean you have a bear market with high inflation. It just means the market doesn't like unpredictable things. Does that right. make sense? So And, and, and here's and, and, and because I wanted to show it anyways, this is a good juncture to show it. Here's how expensive the stock market is right now. Okay. So what's so interesting about this is, is the, the market, the S&P 500 is trading at the same expensiveness, which is not really a word, but it's trading at the same valuation as what we say as 2015. So seven years ago. So the market did get incredibly expensive coming out of COVID. And everybody, remember all of us asking ourselves, oh my gosh, I can't believe the market's rallying so much coming out of COVID, right? Well, the market was anticipating this. And so you can see, because earnings are staying solid, but stock prices are coming down, the market's gotten a lot cheaper. This surprises most people here, Zach, to see how inexpensive the S&P 500's gotten just in the past couple of months. Yeah, I mean, I do screens every once in a while. I've seen, it's been surprising to see, because I was just accustomed to seeing 20s on the, on the PE ratios on everything, 20s and 30s. It's been really interesting to see mid and high teens. Um, yeah, a lot of things look like, really good opportunities, but you really have to think about your risk tolerance in this. We're gonna talk a little bit about portfolios. I'm gonna show you a couple of things because we've had quite a few questions here. Um, and, and, and so going back on, and Danny, your question about stocks get cheap fast. Cheap is a relative um, definition based on their earnings. So I'm gonna right. take us a couple steps back here. So Kurt's telling us, and the data shows, which is great, that if a company's earnings are going up, then their price will roughly follow that trend. And I say roughly because they deviate on that chart. There are some times that that's really, it's really painful because the company's making more money, the growth of its earnings is there, but the actual price of it might be temporarily down as people are guessing wrong about the stock's future and then it corrects itself to the right trend line. And that correlation has been in the 90% plus. Um, according to those charts. So the question then is, um, you, when you're trying to figure out if a stock is expensive, you can use thousands of ways of assessing that, but one of them is its growth of its earnings. And so if you can figure out how, mu how much the company's making, how much that's growing, you can decide how cheap the stock is. So when we're talking about chop stocks getting cheap fast, if they're still earning this and the price of it goes way down, well, that relationship between those two numbers makes it cheap. Um, okay, so that's, 
that's giving you an idea of, of how to understand that. I want to, I want to ask, uh, go through a couple questions and everybody, I love, love, love all of the disclaimers, by the way, in your, in your questions, like, I know you don't have a crystal ball and I know you can't exactly predict this, but I'd like you to tell me when the market's going to go back up. And I love it by the way, because we're all thinking the same thing. So um, one question was about, um, you know, when do you expect portfolios to recover and others about like, Hey, I'm, I'm looking at my retirement portfolio. I'm going to maybe retire soon. I'm going to show you something that I think will be helpful. This is, this is just a measurement of 10 different portfolios um, between 0% in bonds up to 90% in bonds. In other words, and it's very simple. We only have a couple positions in these portfolios. They're index funds from 10% to 100% stocks. And this is year to date. So had you been in a portfolio like this, these are just some exchange traded funds, then you're looking at a decline is just the indexes down of about 18%. Or if you had been more in bonds, you're down 9.4% or so. So you get the idea that, you know, when, if you ask, you know, when will it recover? This is somewhat dependent upon your portfolio because it doesn't take a lot for this person down 9.4 to recover. It takes quite a bit more for this person down 18.77 to recover. This goes back to a little bit to the financial planning topics, right? Of, you know, what, what kind of portfolio do you have if you are nearing retirement? But with that backdrop, Kurt, I mean, do you have any uh, guesses. I mean, it sounds like you feel like inflation is most likely not to be as bad as maybe the news um, portrays it. What's your overall opinion about markets? And I know I'm not trying to make you predict because that's hard to do, but but try to give us a feel. Let, let, you know, here's the thing. Can I, can I share my screen yep, again? Yeah, I'm out. Let me show you something. So a long time ago, 30 years ago, when I went to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange as just a punk kid, I had... The, my mentors down there used to talk a lot about big market bottoms. Like when the market really gets going into a bear market and it's really ugly and you're having scary days and things like that, there's like a checklist of things to kind of look for to know when a market is at or near a bottom. It's more art than science. But what you're looking at on the left here are the inputs of those kinds of things. And this is a chart that, you know, I've, kept and run for years and years. And they include things, you know, really intense pessimism, you know, big drops in prices, you know, people coming on TV and instilling panic and telling you to sell everything in the world is ending, right? How expensive stocks are. My grandmother asking me about stocks is always a dead giveaway that something's going on, right? Um, th there's things that are technical indicators, mathematical indicators of how scared people are. And, you know, things like this. Well, in January, remember the market took a big drop in the third or fourth week of January. And that's what the checklist looked like. There were certain things happening. We had this little drop and then we, and then the market bounced some. Then we had a drop in March and then the market bounced some. And then we had another big drop in May, June. And, he, and here we are, and we're kind of having some of these stressful days. A lot of stuff on my checklist is now filling in. And when, and I put some prior big market bottoms here and, and I've, this is my 23rd market correction of 10% or more that I've worked through. And in most of the 23, you got to some degree or another down to a place where all these items are being checked and we're getting a lot of stuff on the checklist. Uh, and, 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 you know, so Zach, I'm much more constructive, um, meaning I probably was holding a little bit more cash than I normally would just because I like to have some dry powder around to invest in things if they, things get ugly. And in the last couple of weeks, I finally started buying some stuff again that honestly, I haven't been able to buy in a long time. Companies that were really expensive, but are exceptional. And I don't know that they're dirt cheap and I don't know that this is the bottom, but I, I personally think we are much closer to the bottom than the top. And we're trying to work through this now. And, and we have a market that got so pessimistic, Zach, and there's so much cash on the sidelines that if we got some inflation readings that were surprisingly benign, you could have a market here that could rip and rip aggressively. Um, because earnings are still pretty dang good. 
And there's starting to be some real value showing up out there in the marketplace. So I'm at a place here where I'm now erring on the side of, of sharpening my pencil and investing in things that are hard. Uh, you don't get very many chances to buy after a big sell-off. Let's put it that way. You know? And one thing I'm going to chime in on this, this is something that I found really interesting. I like to look at like historically what's happened in markets when we are in a midterm year, for example. Uh, would you know it? And I don't know if you guys would have guessed this, but if you were to guess, what's the worst performing year for any sitting? Well, not year. What's the worst performing quarter for a president? What quarter is the worst one? If you were to go back to the 1900s, early 1900s to today, what would be the worst performing quarter? Quarter of year, a quarter of their quarter, like quarter, of, quarter of a quarter of a year in their term. So you've got year years. one, four years. It's, I'll just I'll just cut right to it. It's it's this last quarter we just ended. It's Q2 of a midterm year. Historically speaking, the numbers, this goes back to my favorite thing with Mark Twain, where it's like history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Um, there's a certain part of it. June historically has been down the worst month in midterm year. We just exited and we just had the worst month of the year we've had so far of a down year for us so far. I, I point that out to say, Kurt's done a good job of like providing some tailwinds that we could have that could kind of propel the market could be positives. You start to think, well, midterm years historically have been positive and they've made roughly six to 7% of their average return in an average year, which they make 10%. They've made them in November, October, November, and December. Those are their months where they average the best. Now I know that's, you wash a bunch of years in there, but I think that's really interesting. We've had negative economic data coming out. We also happen to be coinciding with a negative political headwind that came in. And if we take a step back and we try to separate them out, we could kind of go, well, this might just be some negative economic data with a naturally negative time frame for a president. And some of these positives will start to manifest themselves, we think, in the marketplace. I expect the latter half to be better, for sure, than what we've experienced this time. Yeah. And we're seeing some interesting things. Even today's action in the market is really interesting because the market was absolutely getting throttled again this morning, just like on Friday. And you know what was interesting was all those technology companies let us out of the hole this morning in, in, in a day that could have very well turned ugly and spiraled out of control. It happened on Friday as well. So you're actually starting to see some real exhaustion in the selling, especially in those big, strong technology companies. It, we're working on building a base here. So I, you know, like I said, you never know. And there could be another leg down. And I think the market would be spooked by another really bad inflation reading. But I just showed you a ton of data that shows we're getting a lot of slowing. And, and, and I don't want to be caught on the other side of this now. Because if the Federal Reserve engineers a soft landing, like Matt said, where you get a little slowing and it's a healthy slowing, we have a market here poised to really have a next, in the next couple of years could be excellent. And I don't want to be too rosy because the inflation is a genuine problem, but we have the ingredients, Zach, for setting up a really nice market the next couple of years. Um, and, and, I, and I'm liking it more. I'm liking more of what I'm seeing now than even like a month ago. And the other thing I'll chime in on that, and this is one of those measures that I look at, that I like to look at. I like to look at how many stocks in the S&P 500 are trending up. And the way they base if a stock is trending up is they look at its average price over the last 50 trading days. And they say, is the price today above that 50-day moving average or is it below that? Right now, under 2% of the companies in the S&P 500 are trading above their 50-day moving average. That means there's less than 10 stocks out of the 500 plus stocks that are in the S&P 500 that are trading on a positive trajectory. And so this is where it's like, you kind of start to have to ask yourself, could it, how much worse could it get with all the stocks currently being in a downtrend? And normally, historically, if you go back and you look at that indicator, normally when we reach these levels, they end up being really wonderful buying opportunities, even as short as a year to five years later. So right, let's tackle energy and fuel. Yeah, I think we got the, the two questions there and I haven't forgotten about you, Enrique. I was just trying to find the right, you know, whoever the other person was that asked that question, you just bumped them together. So we have, um, what do you think will happen with energy, the energy issue? And will it matter as there is an intended transition 
akin to trying to learn to swim in the deep end of the pool with no life jacket. And then the other one, I think it's pretty similar. What do you predict for fuel prices? And what relevance does fuel prices have on the market? Well, give us really, a feel. yeah, I mean, I'm Matt, I don't know where you're coming out on this, but it's really, energy is such a tricky thing. I have, I have now, so I've been in the business 30 years and I have traded through several of these wild energy rallies and then sell-offs because here's the problem with like, let's just take oil, but there's a bunch of things you could do like oil, but let's take oil for a second. When we're having shortages, oil's price skyrockets. The price at the pump goes up. We all flip out. We start having a lot of heated debates about energy policy. Don't even get me going on that because I got my own opinions about this as well, like everybody else does. But here's what actually ends up happening. When, when the global economy starts to slow, remember what I said, the cure for high prices is high prices. So when it costs $5 a gallon to $7 a gallon in the United States and $11 a gallon in Europe to buy gas, what does that do? Well, demand drops, the economy slows down. Simultaneously, everyone is fighting to figure out how to get oil out of the ground. So supply goes up. While demand drops, you tell me what's going to happen, right? So, so it's why over 40 years, oil's not up that much. It has these massive spikes and then sells off back down. I think what Enrique is referring to, I'm reading between the lines, is this is then you've got kind of a weird policy complication where we have a regime in Washington that wants to say, we don't like the fossil fuels, so we're not going to let you pull them out of the ground, right? The truth of the matter is, is, well, that is a supply and demand problem. You got the whole rest of the world at oil at $100 a barrel saying, I'm getting it out of the ground. I'm getting oil out of the ground and we're selling it and this is what we're going to do. So I, I do think that, that, that you could have energy prices stay elevated for a while. This thing in Russia and Ukraine is odd. That, that, and it's creating a supply chain problem for energy, right? But I don't think you're going to be all these people coming on saying, oh, we're going to 200 a barrel. I don't think it's possible. I, I, I really do think you have people spending less, an, a global economy slowing down some, and a lot of people trying to get it out of the ground and get it online. Um, do I think we're going back to 50 bucks a barrel? No. But I do think we're working on finding an equilibrium in here for pricing, just like we're seeing in wheat. Tell me how wheat prices are going down, right? There's a lot of supply out there. And I think supply is going to come back online. I don't know where you're at on it, Matt, but that's my uh I think, I think you're spot on, spot on. The one thing you will find if you're like, what's it going to mean to companies and gas prices and energy stocks, they will probably continue to do pretty well because they're still undervalued based on yeah. oil being valued at $70 a barrel. Uh, if oil stays there, there's still room for energy stocks to continue to do well. But as far as like at the pump, you're spot on. I think, I think you'll see something more like that. That's why you see it kind of peter out above this. Um, it's to where the president's tweeting about it. Like when you're seeing that, it's like, okay, something, something's going to move. And, and although we want to move to clean energy, we have to realize to get to clean energy, we have to burn a lot of fossil fuels. And it's easy for us to say that when we're in a really developed country that has really nice amenities. But when you're in a third world country that you don't even have uh, electricity in your village, uh, it's quite hypocritical for us to say, let's not use some of these great energy sources. Let's just not use them. Um, not realistic. So we probably got to meet somewhere in the middle, which is where we should always meet. Well, and you can see what's happening to the energy stocks. They've been absolutely murdered the past. Well, year. yeah. This, and, the, and people are this slowdown, right? I mean, we're all looking at the same data and saying, hey, things are kind of slowing. I'm not sure crude's rolling to 150 a barrel. Maybe we need to get out of the gas here a little bit. Yep. No, no pun so, intended. <laughs> there's, there's two more questions in here that are probably a little bit more um, <laughs> capita focused. So I'm going to answer those real quick. And then if we have other time, of course, we can talk about whatever. Um, given how far accounts have crashed this year, um, what is the chance of skipping a minimum required withdrawal? Um, by the way, just in general, we've been, I'm never pleased to see our clients have less money than they had before any date. But given the portfolio managers and what they've done, I've been pleased with a lot of the strategies. I just want to throw that out there really quick, talking about um, accounts having gone down. Um, that, let's just throw it out there. I've actually, relative to benchmarks, been happy with what a lot, a lot of our managers have done. They've been right in line with what we've expected, um, although that, that sometimes is hard because we do expect every once in a while to have downturns like this. Regarding the minimum distribution, for those who don't understand, 
when you reach age 72, you have to take out a portion of your IRA every year. And the government just wants some taxes. That's the bottom line. And we're, I wouldn't count on it. I know that it's happened in the past. This is not as, as frustrating and as devastating as this little, this last six months is not the same in terms of pain that we've seen in years like 2009 when they um, allowed you to, to forego taking the minimum distribution. So honestly, I, I wouldn't count on it. Um, that, that's, this is one where I'd flip a coin and maybe it's one way or the other, but the bottom, I actually think it's probably a 75% chance to 85% chance. I'm throwing these, pulling these numbers out of who knows where that no change whatsoever, maybe 15% chance they allow you to put postpone those, but that's, that's generous. I don't think there's, there's much going to happen there. Um, okay. And that's what people do when they predict, they give you a number that's not a hundred percent as an out to be wrong. Right. But Anyway, the other question, um, this is very like housekeeping. It reminds type. me, Zach, it reminds me of that movie, is it Anchorman, where he says 60% of the time it works every time. Every time, exactly. <laughs> like, this exactly. is like the ultimate economist joke. <laughs> yeah. um, I really do believe those numbers, by the way, but it did feel like I was just copying out. Um, okay, so going back to the other question, um, you all, if you do not have, this is very housekeeping, but while we're here, let's talk about it. If you do not have a login to advisorclient.com, and if your money is with TD Ameritrade, which is a lot of our clients, most of our clients' assets are at TD Ameritrade. Um, TD Ameritrade and Schwab are merging, and Schwab bought TD Ameritrade. So over the next year, they keep, you know, they're giving us these little, little tasks to do to kind of clean things up in preparation for that merge. And we're here for you to help you through that process. There should not be much for you to have to do. But every once in a while, you might have something like this. TD Ameritrade, I mean, this makes sense. They're saying, how can this person get their statements online if they don't have a username to go online <laughs> and if they don't have a login? And so, I mean, I get what they're doing. It's a little bit of a nuisance, but um, the chances are that you do have a login but you might have like two or three accounts and not all of them are, are house held together in one login. And so, if, so here's the bottom line. If you don't have a login to TD Ameritrade, um, that's advisorclient.com and you are set up for electronic delivery of statements by the end of this month. I think it was like June 22nd. I'd, I'd have to go. We sent out an email to all the people affected. You need to go in and I did a little video on how to do this, but you need to go in and, and actually create a username and change your preferences. If you don't, you'll start to get paper mail and that's no fun because it's a lot. And then if you do have a login and you're still getting the email from us and the notifications from TD, there's a really good chance that you just have an account that's not coupled together. They don't automatically throw all the accounts in your household because they don't know if you and your spouse tell each other about assets and things like that. So, um, so anyway, let, let us know if you need help. There's a form we can help you fill out which brings all those accounts together under one household and it will make it a lot simpler for you. But Enrique, um, that's, that's the way it works. And um, you, Susan, you asked about what about housing prices nationwide? It's a good topic to finish on. What do you think about housing prices overall, overall Kurt? Um, they've come up a lot here in Utah. I've heard people talk about, a lumber trader talked about how this was just needed to finally catch up, that we probably were under you know under the growth the natural growth rate we should have experienced for a decade and so people might just need to get accustomed to it i know prices have come back down a little bit recently um but i'd love to hear your opinion kurt what do you think about all that they peaked they, they uh, we i really think they peaked the left chart there shows homes under construction it's by far the highest number ever since the date has been recorded in the united states remember we went through this decade of not building and now we're building like crazy Number of homes listed for sale right there, going up every single month like crazy. 22-year low in mortgage applications. May was the, the worst month in 22 years for people applying for a mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, mortgage rates went to 6%. We're seeing a cratering in the high end of the market there. Look at price cuts. In January of this year, only 9% of homes listed uh, in the MLS system had had a price cut. It's about 30% now have had a price cut. So the price cuts are coming online. I, I really think, I, and by the way, I don't think we're going to see a housing crash at all. I think actually what we're going to have is finally a cap and a two-way market. Sellers can and buyers both can have a better dialogue now. I think the market's going to normalize. 
Okay, so that's that's good to I, I like that you clarified that because sometimes people say it's reached a peak, they might interpret that as great. Because I know some people that are just waiting for a great deal. They they think housing prices are gonna come way down, 20, 30 percent, and they're just sitting to wait to buy. Um, and, and if that's a second or third property or an investment property, that's totally fine for you to think that way and make that prediction. But, you know, you have to be really careful of betting your, you know, what school your kids are going to or what neighborhood you live in or your commute or your life and what you want to do on a market prediction that, that you, know, you may not have it right. And so a peak doesn't necessarily mean a decline. It just means it may normalize and, and hover there for a while for the rest of our um, wages and life and just general, ac- you know, getting acclimated to it, right? Well, because we're very undersupplied. We're still very underbuilt. So, so supply is still a problem. You're spot on. You can get a cap in pricing, but it's not like house prices are going to drop 20%, right? I mean, you know, they'll, they'll come in a little bit, they'll drop some, but we're not looking for a major drop either, but we are definitely looking for finally a stalling and a cooling to, to, to the pace of, of, of hikes, you know? Love it. We hit, the, we hit the hour. Thank you all for joining. We really appreciate the questions. You guys are wonderful. You can tell you're tuned in and figuring this out. Um, let us know if you have questions. Uh, of course, talk to your advisor. We'd be happy to help. I, I, I think we should start incorporating the word prattle into the name <laughs> of the quarterly call. Like We could literally just call it the 2022 Q2 We're prattle. We're going to call it prattle. The prattle. prattle. The prattle. <laughs> Uh, do you think people would join though? Is that's the question? Oh, they'll join. They love your prattle. Uh, well, Carl <laughs> likes your prattle apparently. I'm just here offending people. <laughs> but, uh, uh, all right, thank you all. Thanks, really guys. appreciate it. Thanks, guys. We'll see ya.